Please be seated. Colleagues, I'd like to call to order the 11th meeting of Municipal Council on June 6, 2023. I'll start by reading a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Lene Pewak, and Attawandron. We honor and respect the history, languages, and culture of the diverse Indigenous people who call this territory home. We acknowledge all of the treaties that are specific to this area. The Two Row Wampum Belt Treaty of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Silver Covenant Chain, the Beaver Hunting Grounds of the Haudenosaunee Nanfan Treaty of 1701, the McKee Treaty of 1790, the London Township Treaty of 1796, the Huron Tract Treaty of 1827 with the Anishinaabek, and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum of the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee. The three Indigenous nations that are neighbors to London are the Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and the Muncie Delaware Nation, who all continue to live as sovereign nations with individual and unique languages, cultures, and customs. I also want to mention that the City of London is committed to making every effort to providing alternate formats, communication supports for meetings upon request. To make a request specific to this council meeting, you can contact council agenda at london.ca or 519-661-2489, extension 2425. And with that, I'm delighted to uh, move to the singing of the national anthem. From June 10th until 18th, London celebrates for City Music Week. This next performer will be a part of the citywide celebrations in Canada's UNESCO City of Music. London, Ontario singer-songwriter Bella Rosa grew up in a home filled with music. Her musical style transitioned from pop to rock before she arrived at alt-pop, a genre that feels like a safe place for her. I can now write how I feel. Alt can be anything. It doesn't have to be either happy or sad, she says. She admires artists like Billie English, uh, uh, Madison Beer, and Maggie Lindemann, and is influenced by artists like Nella, N Nelson, she's gonna correct me on this, Nessa Barrett and the band Evanescence. With over 300,000 streams on Spotify and more than 160,000 listeners in 152 countries, Bella is an award-winning artist making London proud. Please join me in welcoming Bella Rosa at this time. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love. Carton brace por telepe, il se por te la croix. Ton histoire est une d'épopée, tes plus brillantes exploits. God keep our land. Glorious and free, oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Oh Canada, we stand on guard for.
Next, I'll move to disclosures of pecuniary interest. I'll look to any colleagues who have disclosures to make for tonight's meeting. Okay, seeing none, we'll move to recognitions, and I'm gonna start with Deputy Mayor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. Colleagues, although our citywide London Pride Festival does not take place until July, activities and events are taking place this month as Canada officially recognizes Pride Month in June, and I rise to recognize that today. I wanna to take this opportunity to recognize that I, personally can be here in this chamber today as a duly elected official because of the work of so many others who came before me, who stood strong in the face of discrimination and oppression, and who stood to say enough was enough and demanded that 2S LGBTQ plus people be treated equally. I want to specifically highlight the 2S part of that acronym because Indigenous cultures long recognized two-spirited people in their cultures as equals. And it was only the arrival of the Europeans that criminalized homosexuality on Turtle Island. Another example of the lessons we can learn from our Indigenous peoples. And after centuries of persecution, in 1969 then Justice Minister and eventually Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau decriminalized same-sex activity with Bill C-150 and uttered his famous words, there is no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. However, decriminalization was only a step in the fight for acceptance and equality. And we have our own history of discrimination and oppression of the LGBTQ2S plus community right here in London, of course, with former Mayor Diane Haskett and members of council in 1995 refusing to proclaim Pride Week or former Police Chief Julian Fantino's gay witch hunt Believe it or not, while councillors like Gina Barber and Cheryl Miller or MPs like Irene Matheson have been participating in Pride festivities for many years, it was not until the 2011 Pride that then Mayor Joe Fontana and Police Chief Brad Duncan first participated in a Pride parade in this community. That's barely a decade ago, before we had a mayor and a police chief participate in Pride. And it was only in 2018 uh, that the previous council, two previous councils ago, uh, apologized for that 1995 discrimination, thanks in part to support from former councillor Jesse Helmer and current mayor, uh, and then Ward 7 councillor Josh Morgan. And I thank you for that, Your Worship. But as far as we've come, make no mistake, discrimination and outright threats to the 2S LGBTQ plus community continue to this day. We saw acts of harassment at Wortley Pride last summer, and as recently as today, threats have been made of a repeat attempt to disrupt the event this weekend. And of course, we've seen the outright targeting of the 2S LGBTQ plus community by the council in Norwich, which bowed to bullies and banned pride flags on municipal property, leading to the resignation of Councillor Alicia Stubbs in protest. But I want to close by thanking all of you, the members of this council, the members of our senior leadership team, the amazing staff of our PRISM group here at City Hall, um, who've shown yourself to be allies of and members of a strong 2S LGBTQ plus community in London today. And I wanna thank all of those Londoners who've reached out and expressed their support to me personally, as I've spoken out against the renewed attacks on our community. So finally, I'm gonna borrow a slogan that dates back, at least as far as I could find, to the Stonewall riots in the USA, perhaps farther, but to all the bullies out there who apparently are so insecure in their own sexual identity that they want to intimidate and silence us. We're here, we're queer, get used to it. Well said, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm gonna to move to the podium for two recognitions that I will make. <clears throat> uh, colleagues, today March, marks June 6th, 
This is the two-year commemoration of the terrorist attack that claimed four lives on Hyde Park Road and three generations of the Absol family, our London family. On this day, we honor the memory of Talit, Salman, Medea, Yumna. We also remind ourselves of the responsibility each of us have to young Fayez, the lone survivor of the attack. We owe it to him and all Londoners to combat Islamophobia, not only on this day, but each and every day. Preventing the spread of hatred is a daily exercise, one that involves the full commitment of individuals, communities, and governments. There's a vigil tonight at Hyde Park and South Carriage Road. I look forward to joining Londoners of all ages, faiths, and backgrounds who will be in attendance. And I want to just remark on an experience that I had as we moved through the initiatives that marked the commemoration. Um, one of the many things I participated of but was of significance to me was uh, at the Mac Hyde Park location where um, there was a circle. I believe mean, Councillor Rahman and Councillor uh, Lehman were there as well, where members of the community shared thoughts, memories, and stories about the Londoners that we lost. And I'll say that was a very powerful moment for me. Um, it reminded me not only of the impact, the tremendous impact that those Londoners had on our community, their friends, their neighbors, their families, it also made me think about the lost contributions that they could have made should this attack have not had happened. But I do know that each and every one of those Londoners we lost continue to have a positive impact on our community. As you hear the stories of their accomplishments, the way that they approach life in this community, um, each and every one of them are inspiring in their own individual ways. And I know through those dialogues that I had with, uh, with their friends and their family members, um, I learned much more about each of them and, and learned what I could be inspired by by those four um, brave souls that we lost two years ago. So at this time, I'd like all of us to just rise and join me in a moment of silence to honor our London family and the four lives that were lost that day. Thank you. I hope to see many of you at the vigil tonight. <clears throat> well, um, my psychic recognition um, is today is not just a, a day that we remember here in London, but a day that the world remembers, because today marks the 79th anniversary of the Allied Forces invasion of Normandy, which we call D-Day. Nearly 150,000 Allied troops landed or parachuted into the invasion area on D-Day, including 14,000 Canadians at Juneau Beach. The Royal Canadian Navy contributed 110 ships and 10,000 sailors. The Royal Canadian Air Force contributed 15 fighter and fighter bod bomber squadrons to the assault. Our own Holy Roller tank, which now rests in Victoria Park, also landed on Juneau Beach that day. Total Allied casualties on D-Day reached more than 10,000, including 1,074 Canadians, of whom 359 were killed. By the end of the Battle of Normandy, the Allies had suffered 209,000 casualties, including more than 18,700 Canadians, and over 5,000 Canadian soldiers died. Now, I know colleagues have heard me say this before, uh, but I will say it again today. We stand here in council chambers, and there's a mace, and the ceremonies, and we have our debates, and we get to come in here and express you know, the wills and views of our constituents. And I think each and every one of us needs to remember when we enter these chambers, the sacrifices and the lives that were lost to ensure that democracy and freedom in this country exists in the way it does today. And that privilege that we're able to exercise um, has come at great and tremendous cost through history. And each and every day, I want us to take moments as we enter these chambers and we cast our votes and we have our debates to think about those who made this chamber possible in our city and in cities across Canada and cities across the free world. There are those who continue to struggle with democracy around the world today, and, and that democracy is more often under threat than it is flourishing. And I know Canada is a strong ally in the world to free and democratic countries, engages where it can in the, these efforts. But there are soldiers who are Canadian soldiers today who are on the front lines of those fights who support and train, provide equipment to others. 
And so although we have the great privilege of being here safe, secure, and free in this chamber, there are others who are desperately fighting for those privileges around the world, and they do so with the support of Canada, and in some case, some Londoners as well. So in recognition of all those who were lost, including those who made this chamber possible, and, and include those who were, who were from London who fought in the Battle of Normandy and D-Day, I, I wanted to ask everybody to rise again for one last moment of silence today for those who we can remember, lest we forget. Thank you. And thank you again to those who made the ultimate sacrifice in service to our country. I'll just check to make sure there's no other recognitions. I don't think anybody flagged anything for me. Okay, seeing none. A review of confidential matters to be considered in public, we have none. Council in closed session, we have five items on the uh, regular agenda. There is no added agenda for items for council in closed session. I would look for a mover and a seconder to move into closed session. I see Councillor Cuddy seconded by Councillor Pribble. Uh, any discussion? Okay, that'll open for voting in the system and they are for the reasons that are on, listed on the public agenda. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, we'll just be a few minutes as we transition to closed session. For those in the gallery, uh, you'll have to leave while we do the closed session. Uh, it shouldn't take us too long, and then the doors will be back open when we resume public session for the public event.
Okay, we're back in public session, uh, colleagues. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to move to item five, which is confirmation and signing of the minutes of the previous meetings. We have the 10th meeting held on May 16th. I'll look for a mover and a seconder of the uh, Councillor Lehman, seconded by Councillor Hillier. Okay, any comments or changes to the minutes? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, for the first time we have no communications or petitions. Uh, we don't have any motions for which notice is given. So we're on to committee reports and we'll start with 8.1, which is the ninth report of the Community and Protective Services Committee. I'll go to Chair Peloza to present that report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's a pleasure to put the entirety of the ninth report of the Community and Protective Services Committee on the floor. All the votes were unanimous and I have no notice to pull anything separate. Okay, I'll just check to make sure no one wants to have anything dealt with separately because the chair is willing to put the whole thing. It looks like the chair is good to move the motion. Thank you. Uh, so all items are moved and on the floor. Highlights include item um, the London Fire Department establishing and regulating the bylaws, just a routine update from bylaws um, from a review from 2006. The outcome of our winter response program report was given and the London Fire Department single source purchase for bunker gear. Uh, the city found an opportunity to do joint purchasing, which is lovely and wonderful, um, saving thousands and thousands of dollars per item and with new opportunities to be part of this canoe partnership going forward, hopefully realizing more savings coming back. So thank you to staff for the work on that. All right, any other comments from colleagues on the items, the whole committee reports on the floor? Okay, I don't see any, so it's moved by the chair. We'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, and that concludes the report. Perfect, thank you. Uh, item 8.2 is the ninth report of the Civic Works Committee. I'll turn it over to Chair Rahman to present the report. Uh, thank you and through you. Um, I'd like to put forward the ninth meeting of the Civic Works Committee. The report uh, is in front of you. Uh, the committee met on May 24th. We had really great discussion um, about the downtown bike locker pilot project and new traffic and pedestrian signals and pedestrian crossover. Uh, I'm looking to put items one through eight on the floor and uh, we'll be pulling item number nine. So the chair is willing to move a motion for items one through eight. Would someone like something else from that one through eight section dealt with separately? Councillor McAllister. Um, I would like uh, item five pulled. Or so is that, that already pulled? Sorry, I didn't. Item five. Um, the. That's, that's right. Can you, no? do you, can you oh. tell me the title or no? Uh, no, sorry, never mind. Okay, yes, so the only thing being pulled so far is the Automated Enforcement Program Expansion Single Source. Everything else is in the motion. So, okay, everybody looks good with that. So are there any comments or questions about the items that, are, that the chair has put on the floor, which is items one through eight on the council agenda? Chair, I don't know if you have any further comments or if we can, okay. We'll proceed with the vote then. I'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Chair. Uh, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Vice Chair McAllister to put item nine on the floor. Okay. Uh, okay. Vice I Chair like, McAllister. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I would like to put um, item nine on the floor. Okay, uh, so the Vice Chair will put uh, item nine, which is 4.3 from the committee's report, automated enforcement of 
uh, debate and enforcement program expansion of single source on the floor. I have Councillor Rahman on the speaker's list for comment. Uh, thank you, and through you, I'd like to amend item nine um, and include the clause that was contained in the report, clause G, that civic administration be directed to investigate and implement additional red light camera locations, <clears throat> excuse me, as may be, as may be feasible. Um, I'll allow, I think you. Just give me one second and uh, we'll make sure. I just need to get a tiny bit of procedural advice and then I'll look for a seconder. Okay, so the vote was lost on a tie at committee, which means there was no recommendation of, to, from the committee on that, so there's nothing to defeat. So the addition of this as an amendment, I'm going to uh, take as a legitimate addition, and I'll look for a seconder for that amendment. Councillor Trostow is willing to second. Um, we're gonna get that up on the screen so colleagues can see it. You let me know when. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll open debate on this. Remember, we're at council, so you get to speak once, so. Use your time wisely. Um, I, I will go to the, the, the counselor who moved it um, to provide uh, the rationale for the, uh, the moving. Uh, thank you, and through you. So uh, we had some discussion at committee uh, about this, and as you'll see, it was a choo-choo uh, vote. Um, and what we heard from staff was that there was opportunity to uh, look at additional locations for investigation and implementation. What we also heard quite clearly is that we do, do see value in this program, that there is value to, uh, to those that are, are, are driving in their vehicles and, and the types of in injuries and the types of accidents that occur when we have red light cameras, um, we see a reduction, uh, which I think is really important. And then we also see that halo effect that it also encourages better driving behaviors outside of where that red light camera is as well. Um, so knowing that we're seeing value, knowing that we have a program that is, uh, in my opinion, and fiscally uh, a responsible program as well. Um, I do see opportunity uh, with the staff providing their guidance as to where these can be uh, uh, implemented, and so that's why I deem this worthy to put forward. Okay, I'll look for a speaker's list for debate. Nope, oh, Councillor Frank, go ahead. Thank you, yes, I'll be supporting this as well. Um, I had a friend recently almost uh, get hit, well, she did get hit, her bicycle got hit um, by somebody speeding red at Wellington and York recently, and um, I think that not only is this good from a financial perspective, but from a safety perspective, trying to ensure that people who are walking or biking um, are able to do it safely at some of these major intersections, and I hear constantly time and time again that people are running reds because they're getting frustrated, and, and I think there's a very large human cost that we run the risk at if we don't move forward with trying to prevent these, and I think this is one of many components that we do, um, but I think that this one is also one that is uh, fiscally responsible. So I will be supporting this as well, not only because it, it makes sense, but it also um, could potentially save people's lives. Other speakers? Oh, Councillor Hopkins, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, and I'll probably repeat um, some of uh, the comments that my colleagues have already made, but I will be supporting this, I recall. A number of years ago, when we introduced the red light cameras to these 10 intersections, it was quite uh, a debate, and uh, we can see that there's a lot of value that we uh, receive by implementing it. I really like the word, the halo effect, as we uh, create a safer city to move around. So uh, definitely supporting this moving forward. Go ahead, Councillor Lehman. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, I'll echo what I've heard uh, so far. 
Um, just from, uh, again, from a police board perspective, uh, we know that resources uh, uh, that the police have uh, to uh, address traffic uh, situations uh, have been severely limited. You know, I think we hear about it all the time in our wards. Uh, we hear about excessive speeding, uh, noise, and, uh, and uh, running lights. Um, would I prefer probably to have a eyes on view to issue tick traffic tickets uh, as opposed to an indiscriminate camera? Probably, um, but the reality is uh, we have to provide safety on our streets and uh, given the constraints that, uh, uh, financial constraints of the police services, uh, I think that this is, uh, this is a prudent uh, way to go. Deputy Mayor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'll be brief. I, I would actually say, um, uh, unlike Councillor Lehman, I'd rather have more red light cameras. They can catch everybody who's running a red light while an officer can only catch one person at a time. Um, so I think that this is a very good investment. I'm uh, very happy to support it. Uh, I only wish we could uh, ramp up the automated speed enforcement just as quick, but I know there are logistic challenges to that. Um, but I am very supportive of this. Um, I think I've been very, very clear. It's not that hard to follow the rules of the road. Uh, the light is red, you stop. You don't want a ticket, you follow the rules of the road, and red means stop. So let's get these in, and let's get them up and running as quick as we can. Councillor Trosau. Thank you very much. Um, I, moved, I moved this amendment at the committee because I wanted to give the staff the opportunity to expand the program uh, as far as they feasibly could. Um, there was really no opposition to this um, program. Uh, it was very well received. Uh, it was very well received by a four to nothing vote of the committee. And what we're actually debating right now is not the implementation of the program, which is in the, in the main, in the main, uh, the main body of the, of the motion, but the additional language uh, to authorize our staff, to uh, direct our staff, to ask our staff to to see if we can uh, push this a little a little further. So I think I think this makes a lot of sense, and it'll save a trip back to the committee, and uh, hopefully we'll get some good news from our staff that there's um, that there's room for a little bit more, and um, I'm hoping our staff can um, maybe add some context to this, because it sounds as if we're debating the merits of the red light program, and we're not. Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship, and we appreciate the time between committee and council to review our numbers. Staff had proposed expanding the program by an additional 10 cameras. We're confident that we can expand it by about 20 within the context of uh, the resource limitations for processing the court's appeals, those sorts of issues that underlie the, the, the program itself. So we are confident we can put in 20 new cameras, and we look forward to moving that forward, should that be the choice of council today. Okay. Any other speakers? Okay, so this is the amendment, um, which you can see before you on the screen, uh, that uh, the Civic Administration be directed to investigate and implement additional red light camera locations as they may be feasible. You've heard some, uh, I see I, I see you, Councillor Van Meerbergen. Um, you've heard some information from our staff as well as, as what that means in context. And I'll go to the next speaker, which is Councillor Van Meerbergen. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. The, um, I just, I just wanted to uh, confirm, we're, we're now looking with the expansion of 20 uh, intersections uh, under this program. And I, I wanted to ask staff, at what point will there be diminishing returns? Because we're using intersections that maybe don't really have a problem or an issue. And do we run the risk of having to fund it uh, out of our own budgets, because correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, the program is basically self-sustaining. Uh, but at what point does that uh, balance tip? Uh, because we do have diminishing returns. So I'd like to ask staff, uh, is that a risk we run if we go more than 20? Because that was the uh, the number that staff had originally recommended. Go ahead. 
Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, certainly this program is meant to be self-sustaining and any revenues in excess of the program are directed to road safety. There is a risk absolutely at some point in the future in a perfect and a hopefully ideal world that we get to that we aren't generating revenue because the behavior has stopped. Right now we do believe there are enough intersections in the city where this uh, this technology can be helpful from a safety perspective that we do not believe that there's any risk in terms of long-term financial commitments the program cannot fund. That is also one of the reasons we're cautious about massive ramp-ups in that program to add a permanent staff, those sorts of things. If those revenues don't materialize in the future, then we would not have a source of financing. At this time, with what's being recommended here, we're confident it can continue to self-fund over the reasonable attrition of people who'd be involved in supporting it. Okay. Any other speakers? Well, I mean, or, sorry, Councillor Van Mervergen, do you have a follow up on that? Yeah, so will staff inform us if they, when they do their investigation to go above the 20, uh, if they feel that it is sustainable and worthwhile to go those few extras, a uh, few extra intersections, we will be told, we will have a report back on that. But perhaps, if staff could comment on what the councillor is suggesting and, and how they interpret the as may be feasible portion of the motion, because I think this seems to be what the councillor is referring to. Thank you, Your Worship, and that's an important part of this motion. So a number in the range of 20, we have not investigated all of those locations. We believe that's where we have capacity. We are fairly sure we have enough intersections that would meet reasonable criteria with this great preventative technology. If we review and the number is 16 or 18, then that would be the number we would recommend implementing, and we are happy to provide an information report back to Council once those decisions are ready for consideration. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Any other speakers on this? Okay, so the amendment uh, is moved and seconded. Uh, this is just on the amendment. I'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Uh, okay, so now I need a, a mover for nine, and maybe, I don't know, Chair, if you're willing to do it now, uh, as amended. I need a seconder for the as amended motion as, as well. Seconded by Councillor Hopkins. So this is now uh, the committee's original uh, recommendation plus the amended motion, which is now part of it, uh, moved and seconded. Any discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. And I think that concludes, right? Perfect, thank you to the chair and vice chair for tag teaming that. Uh, next report is 8.3, the 16th report of SPPC. Um, I chaired that, but uh, I'm chairing this meeting, so I'll have Deputy Mayor Lewis present that report. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I have not been made aware of anything in the 16th report of the Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee that colleagues wish to have pulled to be dealt with individually. Uh, so I'm prepared to put the whole report on the floor unless there's something colleagues want to vote on separately. So this is the 16th report, item 8.3. Uh, the chair is willing to put all items one through nine on the floor. Would anybody like anything there dealt with separately? Uh, Councillor Van Meerbergen. Yes, I'd like uh, 2.4. So the governance working group report, yep. Yeah, that could be uh, called separately. And I just wanted to confirm that um, the report that we had on uh, uh, the climate change uh, report from staff, um, we can vote on A and B separately. Uh, yes, we can. We can divide up the uh, motion as you can see it in the committee report. So that sounds to me like you'd like four, which is 4.1, the Climate Emergency Action Plan Progress Report voted on separately as well? Correct. Okay. Um, and it's just it, A and B that you want separate? It, yeah, if I can get A and B separate, just like we did at committee. Okay. So that means, uh, Chair, it sounds like you can make a motion for one, two, three, five, six, seven, and eight, unless anybody else is looking for something separate. Okay. 
Yeah, so I will move the entire report exclusive of uh, four and nine on the council agenda, which are 4.1 and 2.4 on the committee agenda. Okay, so the chair has moved everything except the climate emergency action plan progress report and the first report of the governance working group. Those will be dealt with separately. Any discussion on all of those items or any of those items? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that motion for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. And your worship, I'll put item 4A on the floor now. Uh, and then we'll deal with item 4B separately. Okay, so colleagues are clear. The A part is to receive the report. So what the chair is putting on the floor is to receive the staff report. Um, so everybody knows further voting. So that's moved by the chair. Any discussion on receiving the report? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, so we'll open that for voting momentarily. This is just 4A to receive the report. Councillor Hillier. Thank you. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to 0. And I will now put Clause B on the floor. Okay, we're going to get that up on the screen so people can see Clause B has four parts to it. Um, so that'll be moved by the chair. Um, while that's getting up on the screen, I'll look for any speakers to this part. Okay, so that's up on the screen, so we'll open um, Clause 4B uh, and all of its parts for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 11 to 2. Go ahead, Chair. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I'm now going to put item 9. This is the uh, 2.4 from the committee agenda. This is the first report of the governance working group. Uh, I do want to just note um, uh, very quickly uh, that we did make a small change at committee uh, with regard to the uh, proposed calendar which would see the Planning and Environment Committee move to Tuesdays at 1 p.m. Uh, in week one, and that in week two, the Corporate Services Committee would move to Monday at 1 p.m. So it was switching the two spots uh, for those committee uh, items in the calendar, uh, and the logic of that being it allows a little more time for communications on planning applications to come in and increases the opportunity to add additional planning committee meetings as needed. Yeah, and I'll just note, based on that change, it's to bring a draft calendar forward under those parameters. It's not to approve the calendar yet. Yes, all the other clauses remain the same, uh, including the uh, senior leadership uh, comments to be provided back to the next governance working group uh, before the governance working group brings forward uh, a final recommendation uh, through SPPC and then eventually to council on next year's calendar. Okay, any... Um questions or comments on the um, governance working group report which is what's on the floor now Hopkins. councillor Hopkins go ahead yeah thank you your worship and I want to thank the uh, working group we it was a long day and lots of work uh, was to be had there I do want to I, I made a, a point of it at SPPC and I think I'll bring it 
forward here at council that the a draft calendar that is going back to staff is a draft uh, to look at daytime meetings. I'm uh, okay with supporting it in draft form, but I still want to be, uh, make it known that I am not um, fully convinced that we should uh, go to full-time meetings, especially when it comes to public participation meetings and having opportunities uh, for the community to participate in the evening. So welcoming the draft coming back to us and looking forward to having a further conversation at the working group. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers? Okay, seeing none, then we'll open this for voting. This is on the governance working group report. Closing the vote, motion carries 12 to 1. And that concludes the 16th report of the Strategic Priorities and Policy Committee. Great, thank you. Uh, item 8.4 is the ninth report of the Planning and Environment Committee. I'll turn it over to um, uh, Chair Lehman and just uh, note that I believe there's an amendment sheet for a few items in your report as well. Um, thank you. And uh, before I put any items on the floor, I'm going to just read it being noted that any and all written submissions relating to applications that were made to the planner and file the planning and environment <clears throat> committee and to the municipal council, as well as oral submissions made at the public meeting held under the Planning Act have been on balance taken into consideration by council as part of its deliberations regarding these matters. Um, as the mayor said, um, I will pull 10, 13, and 15 um, because there are some housekeeping amendments and you have the amendment sheet uh, in front of you. As well, I will have requested that uh, item 7, 2.6, uh, be pulled. I have had no other requests for any other items. Okay, so the chair wants to move a motion with, for everything on the committee with the exception of 7, which is a heritage alteration permit at 27 Bruce and then uh, three items which are related to um, technical amendments um, uh, and just cleanups of the language, um, which is 10, 13, and 15. So would anybody like anything else dealt with separately? Okay, go ahead, Chair, you can grab yeah, the I will, I will put uh, all items on the floor excluding 7, 10, 13, and 15. So those items are on the floor. Um, Councillor Hopkins, are you looking to comment or no? Comment? Okay, go ahead. You can comment now on those items. Yes, I'd like to make a comment on number 16, which is the PPM for Oxford Street East and Clement Street. I am supportive of the recommendation going forward, and I know it's an infill. And uh, even though I have concerns, but it is an appropriate um, uh, development for an intensification. It, it's right on the... Uh, rapid transit uh, corridor, and it's an underutilized site. So I'm okay with that. But I do have um, concerns uh, going forward. And one of the concerns I have is really, uh, as we are about to do, uh, is to approve the zoning application. That really uh, ends the public conversation. And when we see these intensifications coming into neighborhoods, they do change the neighborhoods. And the community does have concerns, uh, and there's no really opportunity for them to uh, inquire. Uh, so I would like to, uh, through you, Your Worship, ask staff uh, if there are or can be further uh, opportunities or what is the process moving forward for the public to understand uh, and to um, sort of be aware of the, the application as it goes through the site plan process. Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, in terms of the public process, as you mentioned, the public process is closed. However, when the site plan application does come in, there's opportunities for the public to reach out to staff to understand the process, to understand what the site matters are, boundary trees in this case for this one particular site, and those remediation measures that staff can undertake as part of the site plan control bylaw. 
Uh, but having said that, there's no input in terms of matters for consideration for the site plan approval authority, but it is a conversation to understand that process, as you mentioned. Yeah, I just want to thank, uh, through you, Your Worship, to staff for that information. I know uh, and understand, and I think it's uh, important that the public understands that there is no input, but understanding the process, still being able to inquire uh, how, um, where the application is, is available to them, and it can be done by reaching out to staff. I, I, I would like to make sure if anyone's um, listening to these, these intensifications that will change our neighborhoods, uh, it, it is important that public participation is being taken away as it goes through a site plan process, but there are opportunities if the community is still um, wanting to know a bit about um, the process going forward that they can still uh, inquire. So thank you. Councillor McAllister. Uh, thank you. And this is in regards to um, number eight. Uh, the closed school site and the evaluation approach of 1040 Hamilton Road, the former uh, Fairmont Public School. And uh, I want to thank uh, Councillor, or Deputy Mayor Lewis and Councillor Frank for um, uh, supporting the motion to investigate uh, the possibility of purchasing the land. Uh, I just want to express uh, my ward's desire to see this uh, site utilized. Um, there is a great deal of interest, obviously, in affordable housing, and I was also pleased to see that included. Uh, and I would encourage, as this uh, comes back to us, um, that we um, look at it, uh, and I hope that we do purchase it and um, are able to, to build some affordable housing, as there is a great need in the city, uh, not only in my ward, but, uh, yeah, the whole city in general. So thank you. Any other speakers for the items that are before us? Okay, if not, the chair has put together a motion with a number of items, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to 0. Chair? Uh, thank you. I'd like to put um, number 7, uh, which is 2.6 uh, heritage alteration permit. Uh, regarding 27 Burr Street uh, on the floor, or open, oh, yeah, I guess on the floor now, yeah. Uh, okay, that's on the floor. Um, Councillor Lewis, or Deputy Mayor Lewis, sorry. Thank you, Your Worship. So I originally supported this at committee. Uh, and then I've uh, had the opportunity uh, to give it some more thought. Um, and I actually... Uh, tuned in originally to listen to uh, Councillor Frank's podcast on the Craig Needle Show. Um, but then I listened to the next episode. And, and that featured Robin Schwartz, who uh, went to school here in London at Western, at the University of Western, uh, but who now is in uh, the regional municipality of Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, and who sits on the Heritage Advisory Committee there. Um, and, and her studies uh, actually make her very qualified to sit on that committee. And I listened to her talk about how the, the, uh, the, the discussion was framed around um, what is really a heritage and, and what is, quite honestly, nimbyism just, um, uh, presenting itself as heritage protection. And I listened with great interest as this uh, woman expressed uh, from her own professional training and background and her own experience on a heritage advisory committee how restricting people from making improvements to their home by overly prescribing materials that they can use is really actually detrimental to preserving legitimate heritage. Uh, it is expensive. Um, it often doesn't last as long because the materials are of a quality uh, that can't survive uh, the elements as long. And when we're talking about these things, and in this particular case, in this particular application, it's a wooden porch. It's a porch that was in absolute disrepair. And the, the complaint and the reason for denial of the heritage alteration permit is not because the porch was replaced by something that looks radically different than what was there. No, the, the reason for refusal is because it's vinyl and not wood. And I think about this 
as we tell property owners, we want them to, you know, preserve heritage and, and preserve uh, the heritage conservation districts. And in this case, let's let's be clear, this property is not a Part Four designated property. Its designation comes from being part of a heritage conservation district, not as part of an individual val attrib attribution to this building, um, but only as a result of being part of a conservation district. So I started thinking about the, the burden we're placing on homeowners, the cost, and also when we think about some of these other alteration permits that we've seen come forward, what we're doing in terms of, we, we just had a, a, a vote pulled on climate change. Well, when we're telling homeowners they have to use materials of a previous century to repair their home in the name of heritage, rather than let them uh, pers pursue more energy efficient uh, upgrades to their home, um, and, and particularly where they're not changing the appearance of the property. And, if, and I took the opportunity to drive by this property after listening to the podcast. Uh, colleagues know I've had some problems with a knee lately. I was over to see my massage therapist who's in Wortley Village. So I had the opportunity, in fact, on Bruce Street. So I had the opportunity to, to see this property by walking past it, um, not even by driving past it. I know Councillor Frank will appreciate I was walking in her ward and not contributing to GHGs with more driving around. Um, but as I, I looked at this, I thought this is, to me, and I don't mean any disrespect when I say this, but this is just not reasonable to say that now they've got to tear out this vinyl porch that they've put in that looks perfectly in line with every other home on the street and replace it with a wooden one. A wooden one that they'll probably have to replace again in 15 or 20 years because wood deteriorates much, much faster than vinyl. So I'm not gonna support the committee recommendation on this. Uh, I'm gonna vote against it and if it fails, uh, then I'll put forward an alternate motion to approve the heritage alteration permit. So thank you for listening. Um, I encourage colleagues to take an opportunity to listen to that podcast, um, if not on this issue, for consideration in the future issues, because it was really enlightening to me. Okay, so you're speaking against the motion on the floor. Um, I, I will note that if colleagues uh, agree with that direction, you do have to defeat the committee's recommendation to put an alternate on the floor. So there's no amendments here. It's just you'd have to proceed with defeating the committee's recommendation if you want to do something different. So I'll continue with any speakers on this matter. Oh, the chair, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> thank you, I and mean, this is one of those items, it was on the consent item, um, and we had a pretty heavy agenda. Um, I, I saw it, I noticed it, and it, it, it did trouble me, so I kind of looked to committee to see, um, you know, other comments or if anyone wanted to pull it. Um, they didn't, um, but I think we, we've all had those instances where something's niggling at you, right? It wasn't, um, there's something wrong with this. Uh, so I, I did think about it and kind of wavering whether I should act on it or not. And then actually, uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis uh, uh, spoke to me about it. And um, we had a discussion. And um, I think he hit upon all the reasons. You know, it's uh, uh, replace it with wood, it's going to rot again. Uh, then you replace it with vinyl. It's not a heritage designated building, it's in a district. Um, you know, it's. Uh, I think we have to be cautious here. Uh, we're going into times of infill and repurposing buildings. Um, we can't let heritage get in the way without, I understand the value of heritage, um, and I appreciate that and I support that. However, you know, in this particular case, uh, for, again, the, the reasons that the Deputy Mayor pointed out, uh, I'm inclined to, uh, inclined to agree with him. So uh, I will not be supporting it either. Other speakers? Councillor Frank. Thank you. Yes, this one's interesting because I actually don't necessarily disagree with my previous two colleagues um, because when you look at the image, the before and after, it still looks like quite a quaint heritage house. I will remind colleagues that if it's legislation, even though it independently as an independent house didn't go through the whole process, the whole area is protected and we've had this discussion a couple times. Um, and the, the person did replace the, the front porch with both pressure treated wood, so the base was replaced, and then also the um, spindles and, and the railings and that kind of stuff was replaced with plastic, which plastic isn't necessarily the best for the environment either. We are trying to reduce our use of, use of plastic, so um, it's not necessarily the best. I do hear, though, the thing that um, 
I guess bothers me about sometimes is that this person did go through the, the cost, the expense to replace it. Um, and I do worry, I don't know if then these plastic spindles will be sent to a, to a house maybe in uh, Ward 2 or, or Ward 7 or Ward 8, and I'm not really sure if um, they'll be repurposed. So it would be wasteful to throw them out. And that does kind of bother me. At the same time, that all being said, I also don't want this to be a precedent that anyone can go ahead, replace a porch, use the wrong materials, use plastic, and if it kind of looks like what it's supposed to look like, we're okay with it. You know, I just don't like the message that um, sends to the community, especially many of us have heritage conservation districts, and I think, again, then this would apply. You know, you're not supposed to use plastic. That's in our policy. That is why staff are recommending um, the refusal, because they're following the policy that we've made. Um, so I see both sides of the coin, and I found this one difficult as well. I just don't personally want to um, start a precedent that replacing... Um, one, without getting a permit, and then two, um, replacing um, something with plastic is going to be allowed. And I do worry a bit about that. So I don't know if there is a way to ask staff um, if uh, we were to approve this, if that sets a precedent that would allow other people to come forward replacing um, wood materials with plastic, which goes against our policy. Go ahead. Through you, Your Worship, it could set a precedent. And the, the issue with this one in particular is they made the construction without going through the proper process, making that application for the heritage alteration permit, and then seeking approval after the fact. Um, I will also mention that it's not replacing the full porch uh, with their, um, through this recommendation. It's certain elements of wrapping the posts, as we've talked about, not re replacing the, the deck and, and certain aspects of that. So it is like that compromise solution that staff are recommending. Um, if it were to pr proceed this way, but the re refusal is because it's not consistent with the um, with the Heritage Conservation District. Thank you. Yes. So, again, that's kind of more my worry is the precedent setting part of it, not necessarily like this specific one. If I, you know, I can. It looks nice. It looks heritagey. Um, I'm not a heritage expert, so I don't really know exactly what that is, but to G to me, um, especially when you compare with some of the other uh, houses that maybe have done some replacements in the area that um, were before we had the conservation district. Um, you can see they've made an effort, and I applaud them for it and appreciate it. Um, but it's more the precedence, anything that worries me. And if almost, if anything, I wish there was a way that, like, they could perhaps pay a fine or replace the spindles, um, because I actually, again, thinks that there should be penalties if people go forward without getting the proper permits and without following our process. Um, but I do think it's wasteful to throw a bunch of things into the garbage. So all to say, I will be supporting staff in this recommendation because of my worry of the precedent setting, but I completely understand and can um, relate to the previous two speakers and their concerns about making this, um, you know, kind of bad for the homeowner. It's a, a tough time, and I, I do appreciate that the person has already made an investment, so. Okay, thank you. I have myself next on the speaker's list, then Councillor Hopkins, so I'll turn the chair to Deputy Mary Lewis. And this is the part where I get to sit at council because I'm chairing, uh, but I will now recognize the mayor. Yes, and I get to stand. Uh, everybody's a winner. Um, I want to ask a question because uh, here's my dilemma here. As uh, I, heard, I heard an answer from staff that said it may set a precedent, and I hear councillors now making a decision based on that, that it could or will set a precedent. So let, let me ask this a different way, because I think being very clear on this is probably important. Um, if we were to allow this today, are we obligated to allow similar items in the future? I know people can see us make a decision and bring more things forward, but legally would we be bound under some sort of appeal or mechanism to to have to make the same decision or would someone have the right if we weren't consistent to go in and challenge us in some sort of judicial process that we would be vulnerable on. In other words, I actually want a more definitive answer on does this set a precedent from a decision making process or not? Through your worship, just to be very clear, if we this same instance happened in the future and we have the same um, planning framework that's in place right now, we would come back with the same opinion to you. It's not going to change from a precedent perspective how we, we view these moving forward. So council can make these specialized decisions in certain situations. So it will not actually change how we would process an application in the future. So from that perspective, it's not, it's, it's not creating a precedent. 
And my follow-up to that is, I understand staff won't change the way they bring things forward, uh, that we could make a decision one way or the other. Is there an appeal mechanism to municipal council's decision on this that someone could take to a, a different level, or are we the final arbiter on this particular matter? Mr. Mathers? Through your worship, I would defer to legal on that question. Uh, well, let's see if we have, oh, Mr. Card is with us on Zoom. Mr. Card. Thank you, Mr. Presiding Officer. Uh, what I would say is that the decision constitutes a precedent in fact, but not a binding precedent in law. So going back to the mayor's earlier question, would this be binding on a council in the future if the matter were to come forward in the same way? The answer is no. You can always distinguish that situation. And I've heard a number of comments from various members of the council this afternoon that recognize certain attributes or merits of allowing the existing uh, material to remain. Uh, you could distinguish that from some future situation that you found to be different. So it wouldn't be binding uh, on you if the matter were to come forward with respect to another property in the future. Mayor Morgan. Um, Thank you. That ends my comments. I just wanted to be clear on that because I wasn't uh, sure. I, I see, um, though, Chair, that uh, there's one more flagging from staff on this. Okay. Uh, Ms. McNeely. Thank you, Your Worship. I just wanted to mention that it is appealable by the property owner to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Thank you for that. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. And Mayor Morgan, I will return the chair to you. Okay, I have Councillor Hopkins next. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you to my colleagues for this conversation. I, I think it's an important one. I uh, just want to follow up uh, with the last comment. This is appealable. So uh, getting back to uh, my colleagues um, suggesting that we um, um, go against the committee recommendation, I will not be supporting it. And one of the things I understand it's not... Um, binding with future rec recommendations or applications coming forward. But my big concern here is that the process was not followed in this situation. And since the process was not followed, that is my biggest concern because I do not want to um, support uh, residents or anyone not following our processes. We, we have them, we have our bylaws for reasons. They, they should matter. And we as a council, if we're not going to support our processes, then I think it's really important uh, that we change our policies and maybe that's the better way to go. Uh, but these one-offs, I think, do create a, 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 a challenge and uh, the precedent setting is one thing, but supporting um, applicants that do not follow the process is a concern for me. So I will be supporting the committee's recommendation. Councillor Trosau. Um, I'm less concerned through the chair. I'm less concerned about the precedent because yes, the facts can always be, um, the facts can always be argued. Um, perhaps in the next case, there'll be more of a uh, visual uh, problem than, than, than we have here. And I, I do appreciate what Councillor, uh, what Deputy Mayor Lewis and others is saying, but I, I, I'm going to support the staff recommendation. And it's not because I want to be too rigid. And I understand that we have to give people some latitude, but you have to follow the process. And I think it would be one thing if the applicant came in and asked before they did it. And we just can't keep having that because I see the, I see the cumulative effect around the city of, of property owners just sort of picking and choosing which bylaws they decide they're going to follow. If, if we want to change the heritage bylaw, and maybe we should, we should, we should do it. But for, at least for now, I want to support the staff report because I, I think property owners should be, should be complying with what the requirements in this special legislation is. Thank you.
Okay. Any other speakers? Okay. Oh, Councillor Cuddy, go ahead. Thank you, and through you, uh, Your Worship. Um, I'd like to ask staff if uh, the homeowner still is required to pay for the uh, permit fees. Thank you. We need your microphone. Thank you. Through your worship, yes, that would be the case. And any remediation that they would have to uh, fix the porch, the elements of the porch as well. Thank you. Okay, any other speakers? Uh, so this, there's, I will remind colleagues that it is the staff recommendation on the floor. Some people would like to defeat that and do something different. Some people would like to support that and go with the committee's recommendation. I just want to be clear, if there's no amendment on the floor, it's the staff recommendation on the floor. Okay, I don't see any further comments, so we'll open that for voting. I'll just indicate that although you saw Councillor Ploza leave the meeting, she's actually joined us digitally, so, so colleagues know. Closing the vote, motion is lost, seven to seven. Okay, so the committee's recommendation is defeated. I see Deputy Mayor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I will uh, put a motion on the floor uh, that the heritage alteration permit uh, for this property on Bruce Street be approved. And I'll just remain standing for a moment in case I have to if you're making a motion, you can stand that. the whole time. So uh, I'll look for a seconder for that motion. I see Councillor Hillier. So this is a new motion, so we can have a uh, debate and discussion on this as well. Uh, I'll look for speakers. Okay, I don't see any. So this is a motion to approve the heritage alteration permit. I'll open that for voting. Councillor Pelosa votes yes. Closing the vote, motion carries nine to five. Okay, uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you, I'd just like to confer with the clerk for a second. Sure, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, I will go to number 10, um, the first of three um, uh, items that we will have to um, look to amend uh, for housekeeping purposes. Uh, number 10, um, we have the uh, amendment uh, before you. The rationale is that the map was inadvertently missing uh, from the bylaw. So uh, I would like to move that amendment, Chair. Okay, so that amendment uh, needs a seconder. Uh, so I'll look for a seconder. I see Councillor Rahman is the seconder. Uh, any discussion on this, rather? Which title item are you talking about? I'll go to the chair to just identify the item that we're on and uh, what you're doing. Uh, we are on item 10, 3.1. This is regarding 340 to 390 Saskatoon Street. And um, before you, you have uh, an amendment sheet. Okay. All right, any other? Questions on this? Okay, we'll open this for voting. This is on the amendment that the chair is bringing forward. Thank you. 
Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. So I would like to put, um, I would like to move that as amended. Okay, as amended needs a seconder, so I'll look for a seconder. Councillor Rahman, any discussion on the motion as amended? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Thank you. I have to move to number 13, uh, which is additional residential unit amendments as a result of More Homes Build Faster Act. Um, the rationale for the amendment is the previously considered bylaw referenced the London plan instead of the official plan for the City of London 2016. So I would like to move that amendment. Okay, amendment is moved by the chair. I need a seconder. I'll look for a seconder. Uh, Councillor Cuddy, any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Councillor McAllister. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. So I'd like to move item 13 amended. Uh, item 13 as amended, I need a seconder for the as amended. So, uh, see Councillor Hopkins, I will have discussion. Councillor Trosau. Yes, um, through the chair, I did, I did want to pull and discuss Item C, that the Civic Administration be directed to undertake a review of the current five-bedroom limit and report back. So could that be pulled from the um, rest of the motion and discussed separately? Just give us a second on that. Okay, so yes, certainly possible to divide that up. I'm going to ask the chair uh, if he can. Uh, so we've made the technical amendments. Now we're back to the kind of main motion as moved and seconded. Uh, a councillor would like to have um, part C debated separately. So in consultation with the clerks, it seems like it's easy to do that as the first item we deal with. Uh, we can make a decision on that, and then we can vote on the remainder of the items. So chair, I'll see if, you, if you're willing to put just 3.4 C on the floor. Yes, um, let's put C on the floor. Okay, and because this is amended, I'm going to ask for the same seconder if she's willing to. No, okay, I need a seconder for just 3.4C. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis is willing to second. So just 3.4 Clause C, which is the part about undertaking a review of the current five-bedroom limit and report back to the future planning is on the floor. I'll look for discussion now, Councillor Trosso. Thank you, and through the chair, I'd, I'd like to start by asking uh, staff what the rationale would be to, um, in addition to making all of the changes that were mandated uh, by the province, why we would also um, undertake this particular change, which is a very major change. Through you, Your Worship, um, it was a direction from committee uh, to ask for the consideration of the five-bedroom limit. Um, as we do know that the near campus neighborhood uh, did uh, review did require uh, ultimately a three bedroom limit and uh, through that review uh, subsequently uh, the five bedroom limit was uh, applied citywide um, and through the uh, the review of the additional residential unit it was discussed as part of this to consider looking at that five bedroom limit uh, citywide Councillor. Uh, through, through the chair, does the current legislation, as it's been amended, allow the city to continue 
applying a differential to through different neighborhoods based on whether it's the, for example, the near campus neighborhood or not. Because that, that, that would be a very important consideration here. Go ahead. Through you, Mr. Your Worship, there is no requirement. This is a city uh, mandate in terms of the near campus neighborhood and the five bedroom limit is, in this case, would be unique to London as compared to other municipalities. There's no limit that I'm aware of. Councilor. Uh, thank, th thank you, through, through, through the chair. Um, I, I, would, I would like to request that uh, we, we pull item C. And the reason for that is this is a long, long discussion that has a lot of history. And I know that we're doing this because we're implementing the, um, the, provincial, the pr provincial mandate. But I think to open up this, this, this issue, uh, I, I should ask Steph through the chair, um, how... Is that something that you can easily do, or is that something, because your original recommendation was to retain the five bedroom limit? Mr. Mathers. Through your worship, just to be very clear, this, was a, um, this wasn't brought forward by staff. This came up through the discussion, and it was a resolution that was brought forward by the committee. So um, we will take direction from the committee. There, um, there with the recent changes uh, from the province, it doesn't preclude having a limit such as is in place right now we're having a limit in certain areas um, however if staff if it is the direction of council to take back this back and analyze it we would ask we'd add that to our work plan noting that we do have a lot on our work plan currently Councilor okay. Chosa. Um, thank you in, in 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 my view you cannot have a reasonable discussion about removing the five bedroom limit without at the same time having a discussion about the enforcement of the boarding house bylaw, because um, one of the one of the objections historically, which led to the uh, which led to the institution of the five bedroom limit, was the way that some property owners were um, over overpacking uh, properties relating to a lot of other uh, problems. And we do have a boarding house bylaw. It's it's been my view that it hasn't been enforced as well as it can. And I, I, I think that once we start raising, re removing this additional protection that neighborhoods have, it, it, if you want to do that, I think it should be brought forward as a separate item in conjunction with uh, the question of uh, the boarding house bylaw. But to just do this in isolation, I think, is uh, not, not good policy and flies in the face of uh, a lot of history in terms of why this was brought forward. So procedurally, um, do I need to uh, make a motion to remove C or should I ask for it to be voted on separately or? Well, we're debating it separately, so you can vote on it separately, but just let me, just let me confer on your procedural option. So, Councillor, just let me um, give you some advice because we're at Council. Given this is a matter that has made it to the Council floor, if we defeat it, um, it would become a decided matter of Council. Your other option is if you want to have a larger discussion about this is you could refer this piece back um, for that larger discussion that you'd like to have. Um, if we either pass it or defeat it here, if we pass it, that action would be taken and there would be a review and a report back. If we defeat it, um, we will have decided not to do that. And so that would create uh, potentially a binding precedent for us not to review that for a period of time without reconsideration um, of counsel. So your, your two options are, you, if you're happy with that option, you could just defeat it. If you want to refer it back for some other discussion, you could also uh, make a motion for a referral. Um, to the chair then, my preference would be to defeat this um, addition because I think it's going to raise a lot of uh, other issues. However, uh, I would be very happy to have a separate discussion about this in conjunction with the boarding house issue. And I believe that if this is brought, brought up in conjunction with the boarding house issue, that would ameliorate some of the harm that I see coming from, 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 from this. Um, so would the mover of this uh, motion uh, 
either be willing to defer it for now or uh, uh, accept as a friendly amendment uh, uh, adding in a, 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 a thorough review, which is going to add time uh, with respect to the boarding house uh, bylaw. So the mover of the motion doesn't have a choice. The committee report is being presented. This is a committee um, a direction. And so, uh, so the, there, there really has to dispense with the committee recommendation in some way. So um, you can defeat it. Uh, you can refer it um, back to committee, uh, and you can add the piece uh, in conjunction with the discussion about whatever else you'd like to discuss, um, or it passes. Yeah, the the okay. essential alternatives that you have before you. But we should we have to dispense with the committee's motion. Okay, so way. I would I would like to uh, then suggest that we refer this back um, to the to the committee for for further for further discussion on only uh, only only C. So it's only C on the floor at the moment. So the, the motion would be to refer C back to planning committee for a discussion, a further discussion. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, seconder for the referral. Councillor Lehman, you're willing to second? Okay, so a referral takes precedent. Uh, so the motion on the floor is now to refer C, clause C, which is the only thing on the floor, back to planning committee uh, for further discussion. I will take speakers now on the referral. Uh, and I have, let me just make a list. Okay, speakers on the referral are Councillor Rahman, Councillor Frank, Councillor Deputy Mayor Lewis, and uh, Councillor Hopkins so far. Uh, thank you, three. Um, I won't be supporting the referral. Um, I do think that uh, Councillor Frank, when she brought this forward, spoke uh, quite powerfully to the rationale behind uh, bringing this forward. Um, additional residential units, if we're going to contemplate them, we have to contemplate them fully, and I think that that happens within the five-bedroom, exploring the five-bedroom limit. Um, I understand why, and and I appreciate uh, Councillor Trosso and his his uh, thoughts on this. And uh, again, this is for staff to take a look, bring it back to planning. Um, so to me, that gives us the opportunity to then have further conversation, allow the community to participate in that conversation in the future. Thanks. Councillor Frank. Yes, thank you. Um, Councillor Rahman quite succinctly kind of emphasized what I was going to emphasize, but uh, I was just hoping to get a further examination um, by staff. I know that there is quite a lot of history with this file, um, but that's from previous council, and uh, this is a new council. Um, there's new sets of eyes on this. Um, a lot of things have changed in the last four years, as I mentioned at that um, PEC meeting, and I think that it warrants a second look. I'm not saying that we are already making any kind of decision at all. This is simply, I just want to understand better um, what the limitations are, what restrictions should be there. Um, is this a possibility? So it's really just more information. Um, and as uh, Deputy City Manager um, Mather said, they have lots on their plate. I don't imagine that this is going to rise to the top, and that's fine. I just think eventually if we are going to be doing ARUs, as Council Raman said, we need to make sure that we have looked at everything, and if this is not a stone we want to lift up and, and go under, then I'm okay with that. But I at, le at least like to understand um, you know, what, should we look at this or not as a possible way to augment how many bedrooms um, we have across the city in existing neighborhoods. Um, so I will be um, supporting the original um, motion from committee. Thank you. Okay. And uh, there's a referral on the floor, so people are speaking to the referral. So that sounds like against the referral, but um, I'll let you make that choice yourself. Uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis. Uh, thank you, Worship. So. I want to start by saying I agree with everything Councillor Trussow said uh, about his concerns around C um, and the history of, of the five bedrooms. I supported, in fact, I seconded this at committee because, as Councillor Frank said, I also would like uh, some more information to come back. And I'll tell you why I'd like some more information to come back, because I think it's relevant to the referral um, and to Councillor Trussow's concern about the boarding house rules. Even with the five bedroom cap, we are not stopping people, unscrupulous, often unlicensed landlords, from jamming people into homes. 
You can, you can find examples around the city where there are 12 people living in a three bedroom home, sharing rooms, because that's how they're, they're making it affordable, making ends meet. And, and often it is in the near campus neighborhoods, even where they don't have five bedrooms, they're cramming those students in regardless of the bylaws and, and often without a rental unit license in, in place. Um, that was actually why I, I had added Clause C uh, to the report as well, because uh, we see neighborhoods suffering from parking overflow from the result of this over, over cramming of people into these homes. So I, I understand Councillor Trussow's ask. I'm listening to the debate and I'm, I'm honestly struggling on whether I want to support the referral or whether I want staff to come back with some more information and then dive under this, dive into this a little more deeply uh, because I think the boarding house bylaw does have a role to play in this. Um, I think the rental unit license bylaw has a role to play in this. I don't think this is simply a matter of a five bedroom limit. I, I think that there's some other pieces that come into this. And so that's why I'm leaning towards not supporting the referral because as Councillor Frank said, I, I, this is not gonna rise to the top. Um, I, I know Mr. Mathers and Ms. McNeely and, and their teams have more than enough work probably to keep them busy for the whole term of council, let alone um, adding to their plate. But um, I do want them when time allows to come back to us with some further thought on how we can control this situation because it's not actually just the number of bedrooms, it's how we're controlling the jamming of people into housing that doesn't fit the reasonable number of people. Uh, I know we have a, a, a piece and I, I will just ask for, for a little clarity through staff. Um, is the, I believe there's a, a, a restriction on habitability that limits the total number of occupants in a home to 100 square meters per occupant, but I'm not sure where that falls in our, our bylaws and licensing either. I, I know that's been referred to by staff uh, in terms of rental unit license inquiries I've sent in before. But can staff clarify where that piece falls? Mr. Mathers. Through, through your worship, um, my understanding is that comes from the building code as an element there, so something that, that is quite fixed. So uh, that, that's my understanding where that value comes from. Okay, so that's helpful. So that number we're stuck with because that's provincially uh, regulated. So uh, we can't do much about that. So I'm going to listen to the rest of the debate. I know that you've got another speaker or two on your list. Uh, as I said, I'm, I'm leaning towards not supporting the referral, not because I don't respect the concerns because I think they're very, very valid. I see them even my, in my neighborhood, let alone in the near campus in Ward 6. But I do need some more information on, on how this works uh, moving forward. So. I'm going to listen to the rest of the debate and, and probably make up my mind when the voting button comes up. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. And just following up on Deputy Mayor's comments there, I think we all want the same thing. We do want more information. That's why I'm supporting the referral. It's that simple. I uh, want to thank the committee uh, for bringing uh, the conversation. I think it's an important conversation. Councillor Frank referred to, it's got a bit of history, it's got a long history, and it is complicated. And I think before we do rush into anything, we should really try to understand how it's going to affect our policies. And referring it back, we'll eventually we'll get to the same place. Uh, so I uh, do take note, this is coming from a councillor who represents a ward full of students. Um, I, I, I will... Uh, say that from my ward's perspective, it may not be such a challenge, but when it comes to uh, neighborhood, um, um, near campus neighborhoods, uh, boarding homes, things like that, I, I will look to the counselor uh, who has those challenges in his ward. So uh, I'll be supporting the referral back, getting more information, it's that simple. I think that's what we're looking for with the committee recommendation coming to us here at council. So uh, again, I'll support the referral. Councillor Lehman. Uh, thank you. And uh, I seconded uh, uh, Councillor Trossel's uh, referral. Um, I have had uh, properties in my ward 
um, where absentee landlords have been renting homes out, uh, not by the home, but by the room, and turning uh, living rooms and dining rooms uh, into bedrooms. Uh, turning the property into higher density, and it's not zoned higher density, it's a low density neighborhood, and uh, some serious issues have arisen. So I think for the reasons um, uh, the councillor uh, raised, um, uh, I thought it was prudent uh, to look for a referral and, and to have a discussion in that context. Councillor Pribble. I will not be support, supporting the referral because I believe that it's going to, when we go back to our committee, we will discuss it, and at the end, uh, we are going to send it to the staff anyway. So I want to be prompt. I want to send it. I want to make the decision today. I want the staff to do the work, and then we'll discuss it anyways when it comes back with the staff findings. So I want to be more efficient, more prompt, and we are not making the decision right now that we are increasing the five, but we are going to have the legitimate information from the staff. I will not be supporting the referral. Okay, that exhausts my speaker's list. So um, the motion on the floor is a referral back to um, Planning and Environment Committee. Uh, uh, so everybody's clear that we're voting on the referral only at this point, so I'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion fails, seven to Okay, so we still have 3.4, item C on the floor. Okay, colleagues, so Councillor Trosa would like to speak again on this matter that's important to his ward. He's technically spoken to this motion, then he moved a referral, we went to something else. So I would seek if colleagues want to provide leave for him to speak a second time to this matter. So to move uh, an amendment or something else, you'd need to be on the speaker's list again. Um, so I would look to see if colleagues are willing to give the councillor leave to speak again, um, because the councillor has spoken once at council on this matter, then attempted to take an action. That action wasn't successful. Um, there's been a speaker's list on the action. So uh, uh, I deem him to have spoken. So is anybody willing to move a motion to let the councillor speak again? Otherwise, he's spoken to this matter already. Councillor Frank. You're willing to let the councillor speak twice. Councillor Hopkins willing to second it. I don't think we need to debate this. We're either going to let him speak again or not. So we'll. Okay. Um, uh, we could do this by hand. No, colleagues, we're going to do this by hand, um, but we're, I want you to keep your hands up because the clerk needs to count them. Okay. So the motion is to let the councillor speak a second time. Council, notwithstanding our procedures, all those in favor? Opposed? That motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Councillor, go ahead. Um, I'd like to, um, through the chair uh, and the, to the clerk, I would like to amend C to also include in the report, in the report back, a consideration of the boarding house bylaw 
and the, the, the rental registration uh, bylaw because I think they're because I think they're related. So um, rent registration bylaw, boarding house bylaw would be added to um, uh, the, the staff, what, what's going to staff. I think we'd get a much more um, useful report back. So, Councillor, um, there's a seconder for your motion. Just want to make sure you don't want to speak to it while you're here because um, you've got the motion on the floor. It's moved and seconded. You can speak to it now. Yes, so okay. Sit down. Okay. okay. You cannot separate... You cannot separate, and this is the lived reality of my neighborhood. You cannot separate out the five-bedroom limit without considering what goes on in those five units, in those five bedrooms. And um, you also cannot separate out the, the extent to which uh, the, the owners are complying with the underlying registration requirement. Now, um, I have very serious concerns that that could be, that that could be stepped up. But I also have very serious concerns that the boarding house bylaw is not being enforced. And it's a very difficult bylaw to enforce because you have to get inside, you have to get inside and you have to sort of, you have to play detective and you have to look at things like, are there locks on the doors? Or are there other latches? Or uh, have there been rental, have there been rental um, advertisements that make it clear that what's being rented out uh, is, is not a rental unit. A rental unit means, regardless of how many bedrooms are in it, that the tenants of that unit have uh, the right to possession of that unit. And a boarding house is very different because in a boarding house, you have the right to possession of your room. And you have shared possession of everything else. Now, that may say, seem like it's the same thing, but from a legal point of view, these are very, these are very different. I don't think we've spent a lot of time since, uh, I don't think we've spent a lot of time since the Oshawa case came out talking about the implications of, uh, of, of the DEATH uh, lit litigation in, 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 in Ottawa. And I think a lot more thought needs to be given to the boarding house and the registration requirements. And as long as we're going to uh, potentially open up this five, the five bedroom uh, discussion, uh, I, I think for balance, and for the, for the, in the interest of consumer protection, I think we need to also look at these other two matters. So I would put that forward as, as an amendment. Thank you. So that's moved and seconded. It's on an am amendment now, so new speakers list. Uh, you get to speak again now. You don't have to, um, but you can. So I look for any speakers to the amendment. It's moved and seconded. Councilor Frank. Thank you, yes. Um, I don't mind adding these two things. I think, again, I kind of cleared it off in PEC, but to reiterate, um, I understand that there are near neighborhood, sorry, near campus neighborhood concerns. Um, I think, again, since this policy applies to the entire city, um, perhaps there is an ability to separate those two concerns. But um, moving forward, I do see the councillor's desire to have as much safety for um, the public as possible. So I don't mind adding that. Um, and I hope staff are able to, to, I guess, pull what they will from the two documents to add to this review. Um, that all being said, I think, again, we do need to move forward on this. I think um, when we're looking at ARUs now as well, it's a bit of a different landscape. You know, one, one house, one, like one unit with five bedrooms in it, I can see a lot of this boarding house stuff applying to. But if there's a house with two units upstairs, two units downstairs, and two in the back, all separate, all different locks, all, di you know, maybe they're three semi-professional couples. You know, this is a different discussion, and I don't want to prevent an affordable housing opportunity for somebody um, to have access to. So happy to have these two things looked at. Again, I, this isn't um, top of my list, and I think that staff have a, a bunch of stuff to get through in the next year, um, but happy to have these two things added for consideration. Um, also keeping in mind that I'm hoping that this will be looked at not only at the near campus neighborhoods, but the ability to have more than five bedroom units on a parcel of land in, in other areas of the city where the concerns are different. I have Councillor Peloza next on the list. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, happy to support this. And thank you um, for to the councillor for his advocacy on this and realizing it's just not a downtown issue or a close to campus issue, recognizing there are multiple campuses for post-secondary education institutions throughout the city. And as housing becomes more sparse or out of reach for many, many people are taking um, leeway on their own to set up different units 
renting out bedrooms, um, subletting other things. So thank you for the work and happy to support this. Okay. Those are the speakers I have on the amendment. It's moved and seconded. So we'll open um, the amendment for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to one. Okay, so now I need a mover and a seconder for uh, 3.4C as amended. Uh, Deputy Mary Lewis is willing to move, seconded by uh, Councillor McAllister. Any discussion on 3.4C as amended? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, and now chair, if you could put the rest of 3.4 on the floor. I will put the remainder of uh, 3. Point. three point four on the floor. Okay, any discussion on the rest of 3.4? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Sorry, I, before we open the vote, I need a seconder for that because there was a technical amendment to it uh, earlier, so Councillor Hopkins is willing to second. Okay, 3.4 uh, as amended from the technical amendments on the floor, excluding C, which we've already dealt with. We'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Councillor Lehman. Thank you, I will go to item 15, um, which is 3.6644-646 Huron Street. Um, we have a housekeeping amendment, um, amended the zoning bylaw in clause B in section one to correct the zoning amendment to R8-4 zone and to remove the reference in section two to the exterior side yard. So I will put that amendment on the floor. Okay, so the chair puts the original on the floor and then moves an amendment. I need a seconder for the amendment. Councillor Hopkins, any discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Councilor Trosso. Thank you. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. And I will put item 15 as amended on the floor. Okay, and a seconder for the as amended motion. Councilor Cuddy, any discussion on the motion as amended? Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting too. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Thank you, that concludes the ninth report of the Planning Environment Committee. Thank you very much. That brings us to 8.5, the 10th report of Corporate Services Committee. 
I will turn it over to Deputy Mayor Lewis. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, so I'm going to put the 10th report of the Corporate Services Committee on the floor. Um, before I, I seek to uh, see if anybody wants anything pulled to be voted on separately, uh, if you'll indulge me in a little introduction, um, because I, I think I might be able to assist uh, right away on whether we need to pull anything or vote on it separately. Um, item 9, uh, 4.1 from the committee agenda, uh, the Budweiser Gardens expansion and renovation proposal. Uh, I just want to be clear on what was done at committee uh, so that colleagues know what we're voting on before they decide whether they need to vote it on separately or not. Uh, first, we received the staff report for information. Uh, second, uh, in clauses B and C, we're directing the civic administration to prepare amending agreements. Those agreements have to come back before the committee and then ultimately before council before they are ratified. And then we added a D uh, to this at committee, uh, which included the direction to civic administration to also, at the same time as they bring forward the amending agreements, to bring forward a more thorough review of the financial case for the proposed expansion, including the overview of the city's return on investment uh, from the ex expected from the proposed phases of the expansion in comparison to the ROI of the current agreements that we have. So before we make a decision, um, when these ultimately, when these amending agreements come back, we will be able to compare the proposed return on investment moving forward, as well as uh, how that looks in relation to the existing return on investment that we are getting from the current deal. Uh, so in both cases, uh, these agreements are going to come back for a uh, final discussion at committee and a final approval. Um, but we do need to direct staff on whether or not they're preparing an amending agreement before they can bring that additional information back to us. So I, it's a little bit complicated uh, because of the order of operations on things, but I, I hope that explanation uh, makes it easier for colleagues to digest because there was a lot of information uh, on this item. So I hope that makes it a little easier for folks to digest uh, what direction the committee provided. Um, so I have not been made aware of anything that people specifically want pulled to be voted on separately, uh, but I would seek the, the uh, will of the council before I put the entire report on the floor. Okay, I'm gonna look to see who would like stuff pulled separately. Councillor Frank. Thank you, yes, I'd like to pull item nine. Okay, good try, but uh, we're gonna have nine separate. Uh, anybody want anything else separate? Okay. I'll go to the chair. Oh, uh, Councilor Van Merbergen, go ahead. What do you, what would you like separate? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mayor. If we could pull uh, seven and eight, and if it's feasible, uh, vote on both of them at the same time. Okay, so uh, seven and eight separate, but you're okay to do them together. Okay, so I'll let right. the chair take that as a note for the motions he needs to craft. Anyone else? Okay, chair. All right, so I am going to move uh, the entire committee report with the exception of items 7, 8, and 9. Those are items 2.5, 2.6, and 4.1 from the committee reports. Chair, um, before you um, finish crafting that motion, um, there is some additional information from the clerk related to items that you have contained within that motion, um, which is items 4.3 and 4.4, which the committee referred back to Civic Administration for further information regarding the organization's connections to London. I can tell you if we proceed with the referral back, um, there's no additional information that has come now before council. Um, so the dates for those proclamations would pass before we would even get the information back. So uh, there's a couple of alternatives. They could be pulled, 
we could approve them irrespective of not having the information, or we could just receive them. Um, but either way, no information has been um, provided between the committee and council. So I, I leave that in your hands. Certainly we can, we can approve them as is, but they're gonna come back to the committee with probably no more additional information after the dates that the proclamations were requested. So if you wanna deal with those separately, we could, but I just, that's an additional piece of information the clerk had that I'll share with you as you craft your motions. All right, well, never being a fan of referrals for referral sake, um, I will then move uh, items one through six and 10 uh, from the committee report and we will deal with other items separately. Okay, so one through six and item 10, so that's everything with the exception of the two expropriations that uh, Councillor Van Meerbergen wanted separately, the request by Councillor Frank to deal with Budweiser Garden separately, and the two proclamations that uh, a committee referred. Those will all not be in this motion, everything else is. Any discussion on the stuff that's in the motion? One through six and 10. Okay, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, I will now put items seven and eight from the committee report on the floor. These are expropriation of lands related to the East London Link project and the expropriation of lands related to the Wellington Gateway project. Okay, um, that's moved by the chair. Any discussion on these? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to one. Go ahead. Okay, Your Worship, I am now going to put item nine. This is the Budweiser Gardens expansion and renovation proposal on the floor. Uh, I will note that uh, Councillor Frank pulled this. I will also, also note with apologies, Your Worship, um, that you had actually sent a note saying that uh, there was an amendment to this coming. So I don't know whether that's an amendment from you or from Councillor Frank. So I don't know whether I want to turn to you first or to Councillor Frank, but uh, you both wanted this item pulled, so uh, I leave it in your hands as the chair as to who's going to go first on this one. I'm gonna let Councillor Frank lead this one, and uh, so I will uh, go to her on the speaker's list. Thank you, yes, I, it's always fun when somebody pulls something, and you're like, what's going on? Um, this, I feel like I gave a sneak peek on Tuesday. Um, so this is following up with discussions about um, having uh, city-owned assets coming to us um, for renewal. When they come for renewal, if they're not going to get another significant investment in the next 30 years, making sure they're on track to our net zero uh, climate emergency targets. So um, uh, we have circulated a, an amendment to um, the clerks to have pulled up on the screen, but essentially we're hoping to, and um, the mayor said he would second. So in support of our climate emergency action plan and net zero goal, civic administration be directed to work with OVG 360 to bring forward existing and contemplated plans for energy efficiency retrofits to Budweiser Gardens and offer support for any applications to financial grant programs for the contemplated upgrades. Um, so this, again, is trying to bring all of the assets in line um, to our net zero plans and um, hoping to get your support in working with uh, uh, the private partner on um, the bud to, to make sure that we can uh, bring it in line with everything. Okay, and I express my willingness to second that. Um, I have myself on the speaker's list next, so I'll turn the chair over to um, Councillor Lehman. 
Thank you. And I'll go to the mayor. Uh, yes, so Councillor Frank and I discussed this and I'm happy to second it. Um, there was also an it being noted that we wanted to add in uh, that said it being noted that sources of grant applications could include federal provincial grants, grants from the FCM Green Municipal Fund. Um, uh, I, I'm supportive of this because, um, first off, uh, I think getting that information along with the upgrades to a major facility that is owned by the city and ultimately will fall uh, under our full control um, one day uh, is just a due diligence. Um, we do have a climate emergency action plan. Understanding how our assets will be invested in um, is important. And my understanding from speaking um, with our deputy city manager on this is that there is a plan uh, that they have in place that could be brought to us fairly quickly so we could see it alongside. I would also note that it's not just necessarily grants or municipal contributions that would be needed to make those energy efficient um, upgrades and to the facility. There is an actual uh, portion of the agreement where a, a maintenance and improvement fund um, uh, can be used. Uh, it kind of comes off of the, the profits that get shared by both the city um, sorry, the revenue piece that both the city and OBG 360 share. Uh, and that is also used for these sorts of investments. So us just having a much clearer picture of what the plans are, both current and moving forward, as we contemplate major investments to the facility, I think is, is just a responsible thing to do. Uh, and I'm happy to receive that information at the same time. And um, my understanding is it's not a tremendous amount of work for staff to pull that together because uh, there's been a good portion of work already done on this uh, with, uh, in partnership with our, our provider. And I would invite uh, if the deputy city manager feels like there's anything that needs to be added to this for context on that sort of information, um, I, I, would, I would ask through the chair that uh, she share any information they feel is relevant to this motion um, that uh, would give colleagues some more context. So I'll go to staff. Thank you through the chair. So um, I do uh, did receive a little bit of information actually from the management team at the Budweiser Gardens. So I think one clarification that I will make is it is not actually a city owned asset. The city owns the land which we lease to the trust. The building is actually held by the trust at the moment. It does not become a city of London asset until the lease expires in 2050. So just to, to provide that clarification. However, um, Budweiser Gardens is actually through the OV um, the Oakview Group, which uh, purchased Spectra that was uh, previously the manager, they actually were a founding member as part of a, a program called GOAL, which stands for Green Operations and Advanced Leadership. So it's a sustainability program that is for arenas and sports and entertainment venues. So they are actually operating underneath that. And through this um, program, they actually have a digital portal that provides them to linkages to provide metrics and have data-driven decisions on how to best implement solutions over the course. And they're actually in the process of trying to um, connect with Mr. Stanford so they can actually see if there's things that the city might be able to benefit, perhaps through actually participating in this. So through their normal operations, this is something they've already done full um, energy efficiency. There are things as they have to do life cycle renewal, start to already do, and I have a number of things in terms of their, their living walls, some of the um, food and beverage operations that I've already implemented to be sustainable. So I'm sure they will be happy to share a list of the things that they're doing as they continue and begin to implement more things through their normal operations. So certainly they will not be waiting for the um, additional expansion and renovations to implement. They have already done a number of things and I'm sure they will be happy to share them with City Council to bring that forward in our future report. Uh, go ahead, Mayor. Yes. Okay, thanks for um, that additional context uh, from the Deputy City Manager. And, and I just want to be clear that when I said uh, becomes a city-owned asset, I meant at the end of the next 30 years after the lease uh, is completed. Um, but it is a significant property in the city, uh, something that we, uh, we work with them in partnership with. And so I think us having a very clear picture of what those plans are um, as we work on our climate emergency action plan and our goals alongside over that 30 year period is actually the time frame that we're looking to make substantive change, I think is, is a responsible course for us to take. So I hope colleagues support the motion. Thank you, Don. We'll turn the chair back to uh, the mayor with uh, Deputy Mayor Lewis and Councillor Ferrer on the speaker's list. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, with regard to the amendment, I'm happy to speak in support of this. Um, and I, I will say that uh, I'm particularly 
uh, happy with the it being noted clause uh, because I see that uh, I read between the lines that Councillor Frank is happy to start uh, taking on the work in her new role as a board member with FCM uh, to help us access the Green Municipal Fund. Uh, I know that it was a, uh, a, a opportunity she and I both took uh, when we were in Toronto to learn a little more about that. Uh, that goes to show you the value of, of attending some of these conferences. We come home with some good ideas uh, and this one makes a lot of sense to me. So uh, I will just uh, extend uh, virtually my, uh, my hand to Councillor Frank and say if she needs help uh, uh, getting some Green Municipal Fund uh, dollars to help with this, uh, I am standing by uh, ready to assist. Councillor Ferreira. Uh, and thank you, and through you, um, I just also want to uh, thank Councillor Frank and the Mayor for bringing this uh, to Council. I do believe, just from our conversation in the last SPPC meeting, I believe it was, uh, just for the Climate Emergency Action Plan, everything is going to be coming seemingly by case-by-case -case basis, so I do feel that this is a great start. Um, and I would believe that there's more to come in the future, so I just wanted to also convey my support for this. Speaking to this amendment uh, on this aspect, and I do want to speak to the original motion, so you might as well put me on the speaker list uh, there as well, but I just wanted to echo what I've heard uh, in council here, and, and thank you uh, to both of you. Sure, I'll add you to the uh, main motion speakers list, but uh, we'll continue on with the amendment. I don't have any other speakers to the amendment at this time, so if there are none, uh, we'll have the amendment only for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 14 to zero. Okay, so I need a, a mover and a seconder for the as amended motion now. Uh, chair is willing to do that. Councillor Cuddy is willing to second it. Councillor Ferrer, you're next on the speaker's list for the whole, the whole motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you again. Um, so from our last conversation that we had at committee uh, regarding this one, I said I wasn't convinced. I did do a bit of legwork. I've been going back and forth with the city treasurer a lot. She's been extremely helpful, so I thank you for that. And I have had a meeting with Tourism London, and I have been told, and I've, I'm pretty confident that um, just the concerns with what I was thinking with the Tourism Infrastructure Reserve Fund and that being depleted and the possibility that uh, other monies that could be used or other uh, funding, uh, that fund could fund other cases. I was concerned with that, and I was also concerned with um, possible pressure on the taxpayer base. But just uh, speaking with the city treasurer, it, it is quite clear to me that that I, is, there's not a chance for that to happen. The Tourism Infrastructure Reserve Fund that's funded by the MAT tax seems to be highly scoped, and that scope seems to fit with Budweiser Gardens. So I'm pretty confident uh, that we shouldn't have any issues with that just from what I've heard so far. So I just wanted to also give my support for Budweiser uh, Gardens, and I will be supporting uh, the motion as it is uh, right now. So I just wanted to say that. Um, uh, just because from what I've heard from residents and just having discussions uh, after that committee meeting, I've had people come through that seemed that they weren't necessarily um, very clear on where the funding would come from. Um, so that's why I was going back and forth, really trying to just get that information. So at this, uh, at this point, I'm, I'm pretty confident the way it is. So you'll see me supporting um, this vote. Councillor Hopkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, and uh, I'll be supporting the uh, recommendation coming out of committee. I want to first of all thank the committee for the work that they did. I did not view the uh, YouTube on it, but I'm sure there was um, a bit of legwork. The added recommendation on um, getting a review for uh, the financial case, I really appreciate that. I think as a council, we really need to understand the complexity of, of Budweiser's. We're not approving anything here. We're, we're just um, getting the information that we need for the agreements and everything to come back. So uh, with that, again, thank you to the committee for your uh, hard work on this. Councillor Trosau. Thank you, and through the chair, um, I'm, I'm going to be supporting the um, measure that's in front of us today, but I want to make it really clear that there's a long way to go on this in terms of getting the information that I need in order to satisfy the, uh, the questions that I raised at the committee. Um, I still have those concerns. 
And my understanding, and it's been repeated by the deputy mayor, it's been repeated by, the, um, by a number of people, we're not approving this today. We are, getting, we are asking the staff to undertake certain document preparation, but we are getting, we are getting uh, more, more detail, and I don't think we're at the decision point uh, on, on this today. And with, with that understanding, I don't have a problem with, um, with, with, with supporting this. Having said that, though, I, I, I want to say that I still do not understand, and I hope we get some more clar clarity on this. The current, the current food operation, the contract for the current food operation goes through 2027. And part of what we're being asked to do here in its entirety, which we're not approving today, is to extend the 2027 end date to 2051. And I, 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 I'm having a hard time understanding what is, what is so, um, what needs to be done right away since this is not expiring until 2027 and why we would, why we would, why we, we, we would include such a long uh, ex extension date. So I, I still have a lot of questions about, about that. So the fact that I'm not um, going to be um, voting against this today, I wanna, I wanna make clear my, my concerns ab about the fact that uh, we do not have adequate funds in the accommodation uh, fund right now to pay for this by a long shot. And we are going to have to incur debt. And I think that uh, we're going to have to understand what the implications of that are. Uh, I don't believe that we're being asked to incur that debt through this motion to today. I want to make want to make, make, make that clear. So I am not backtracking on the uh, earlier concerns that I raised about the 80-20 split. Why, why 80? The fact that uh, in terms of on the revenue side, it, uh, it's going to go from 70-30 to 60-40. Why that, why that drop? I mean, I think the, these are all things that still need to be explained. And with that, I'm uh, happy to support this motion today. And I do want to thank, again, uh, the, the, the mayor for helping us out of the conundrum that we were in at the committee in terms of uh, adding the additional language that sort of satisfies my need to get more information. So uh, with, with that, I think we're, um, we're okay today. Anyway, thank, thank you again. Thank you, Councillor. I hope we're okay most days, um, but uh, appreciate your comments. Uh, other speakers to this? Councillor Lehman. Um, so, uh, thank you, and I think those concerns mentioned by Councillor Trossow and Councillor Hopkins and touched on by Councillor Ferrer uh, are valid. Um, the, the councils prior to us that uh, initially uh, did this project, uh, I commend. Um, it was transformational, I believe, in, in our downtown, and, and I think it's paying dividends for what we're seeing uh, being built downtown for people choosing to live downtown. Um, I think it's been a good partnership. Uh, it was a good financial mo model, one that I understand is being uh, copied by other communities across Canada. Um, uh, very prescient in, in uh, what was designed back then. Uh, that being said, um, we're at this point now, and it's incumbent upon us to protect the uh, uh, the city's investment and the city's return on investment. Uh, I'm not against debt financing as long as it uh, uh, produces a, a, a good um, return on investment, uh, factoring in the cost of, of that debt. Uh, we have, have had a good partner in Spectrum, which is now OVG 360. Um, I, I think that was further uh, reinforced by Ms. Barbone's comments about uh, how they're climate aware uh, and uh, in, their, in their projects, uh, in their ownership uh, uh, across this one and others. Um, they've been successful. Um, the major tenant, the Knights, have been very financially successful and I would argue we've been successful as a city. Um, and that's a good business partnership where all partners benefit. Uh, so I will look uh, for the details that come out um, in the coming uh, negotiations and what's presented to us uh, to make sure that from our point of view, as I represent the city, 
and the city taxpayers that we are getting uh, of a sizable investment, which, by the way, I don't, um, uh, I don't diminish that. Uh, it's a building is aged, <laughs> hard to believe, but the, the building has uh, had decades into it now, it's, um, and it's, it's time. Uh, you have to protect your assets, and I think this is uh, a good way to go. Uh, but like I said, uh, and what I've heard from other councillors here, is we will be doing our, um, our job uh, of protecting our interests. Thank you. Other speakers? Okay, seeing none, the as amended motion is um, moved on the floor. Uh, I'll just note, Councillor Plozis has had to leave the meeting, so she won't be participating in this vote. And uh, we'll open that vote for voting. I vote yes. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to 0. So, Deputy Mayor, I, I know you've got a couple other items. We've still got all the bylaws to go through. There's a closed session report. It's been about two hours and 40 minutes. Uh, I, I'd look to see if colleagues might want to take a 10 minute break at this point. I see people nodding. So I know we're not quite done your report, but I think now is a good time because we can come back uh, with some options on those uh, on those proclamations as well. So I look for uh, a mover of a 10 minute break. Councillor Hopkins seconded by Councillor Frank. Uh, all those in favor by hand. That motion carries.
Mayor Bergen, if you're online, if you could just uh, give an acknowledgement to the clerk so we can count you here or not. Perfect, thank you. Okay, um, so uh, where we left off was uh, in the middle of the CSC report. There's two items left. I'll turn it back over to the Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. So we just have two items left to deal with on the 10th report of the Corporate Services Committee. Uh, those are two applications for proclamation uh, where the committee recommendation was to refer them back to for more information. Uh, more information has not been received and as noted uh, at the start of this committee report, uh, the application days will have passed before this referral lands back at another committee. Uh, so. Uh, the committee recommendation is to refer. I'm going to uh, suggest to colleagues uh, that it would be best to defeat the referral and then we can dispense with these uh, either as a, a motion to receive them or if colleagues want to do something different, uh, we can do something different at that point. But uh, first we need to defeat the referral. So I will put the committee recommendation for the referral on the floor and we'll be voting against it. Okay, so the recommendations on the floor for us to take a different action, which um, the action in the committee report is essentially obsolete at this point. Um, uh, we're looking to see if uh, colleagues are willing to defeat this. So that's open for voting and we will uh, we'll vote now. And we're doing them one at a time. So this is just the first one. Closing the vote, motion fails, zero to 13. Uh, so now, in, unless a caller wants to do something different, I'm prepared to put a motion to receive the applications on the floor. And that's all we would do is just receive them. Okay, is that's a new motion, so I'll look for a seconder for receipt. Uh, okay, I see Councillor Hopkins. Uh, any discussion on the new motion to receive? Yeah, go ahead, Councillor Trosa. No, I, I support this motion. I'm a member of the committee. I just I just want to um, say something that I often say at the committee, and that is when the applications come in, and on the face of the applications, they're not they're not complete. Um, to the committee, and we have to go through this and report back up, um, council. So um, this may not be the place to do it, but ultimately, I would like to um, encourage whoever receives these applications to. Um, send them back if on the face of it, it's not, it's, it's not complete. And I'd, I'd be looking for some guidance from the clerk in terms of how to facilitate that, because we, we do this at every meeting. I'm gonna have the clerk explain the process so colleagues understand what they do with these applications. Go ahead, clerk. Thank you, and through uh, the chair. Um, so once these are received, we do review them for general completeness. Um, if committee uh, indicates to us that uh, there is a concern such as here where there's a referral, uh, we will reach out to them. Uh, we have considered, based on uh, this repeated uh, committee discussion about concern about the connection, direct connection to the City of London, we have looked at uh, the form and uh, made that clear to applicants and we're, we're reviewing other options uh, such that that uh, application process is highlighted and the information sought by the committee during its consideration is uh, um, emphasized to applicants. Okay, so the new motion to just receive the first one is on the floor. I don't have anybody else on the speakers list, so we'll open uh, that receipt for, uh, for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Deputy Mayor. And now, colleagues, we will repeat this process for item 12, uh, the application for issuance of proclamation for World Sickle Cell Day. Again, the committee recommendation was to refer. We have to defeat that uh, first, and then we can proceed with dispensing to receive. Okay, so the motion, the original committee motion is on the floor for voting. I'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion fails, 2 to 11. Deputy Mayor. Okay, uh, 
with the committee recommendation defeated, I will now move that we receive the application. Okay, the new motion to, uh, to receive the application needs a seconder. I look for a seconder. Uh, I need a seconder for that. Uh, Councillor Ferreira, thank you. Uh, so this is the new motion to receive. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. And that completes the 10th report of the Corporate Services Committee. Okay, thank you. Well, don't go anywhere because there's an 11th report of the Corporate Services Committee. So if you want to get back up, you can do that one. Thank you, Worship. I am now happy to move item 8.6 on the Council agenda, the 11th report of the Corporate Services Committee. Uh, this was a special Corporate Services Committee uh, there is only one item on the agenda aside from disclosures of pecuniary interests, which was a confidential matter. Uh, so that will fall under council reports in of uh, closed session. Uh, so I will just move the report, which is simply the approval of disclosures of pecuniary interest. Okay, so moved. Uh, I can't imagine there would be discussion on this. Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. And that completes your 11th report of the Corporate Services Committee. Excellent, we're on to added reports, which includes the ninth report of council in closed session. Um, uh, council Ferrer made eye contact with me at the wrong time, so he's volunteered to, uh, to read out our council in closed session report. Um, so I'll turn it over to uh, the councilor for that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, I was voluntold, but that's okay, I'll take it. Um, reporting out at the ninth uh, report of council in closed session um, uh, uh, to uh, lease agreement for the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority Fanshawe Golf Course that on the recommendation of the Deputy City Manager Finance supports with the concurrence of Deputy City Manager Neighborhood and Community Wide Services on the advice of the Director of Realty Services with respect to the lease agreement for the lease of grounds ground spaces uh, at the Fanshawe Golf Course the lease agreement between the city and the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority, the landlord, for the lease of the Fanshawe Golf Course lands for a term of 10 years at an annual rent of $40,500 prior to taxes payable, which is comprised of Part 1, Reference Plan 33R-14008, containing an area of approximately 7.07 .07 acres, or 2.86 hectares, and Part 4, Reference Plan 33R-14008, containing an area of approximately 65.98 acres, 26.7 hectares, be approved, it being noted that the rent payable is retroactive to June 1st, 2022. Okay, so that's moved uh, by the, the councillor. Um, I'll look for any debate or discussion on that motion. Okay, seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Thank you very much. Uh, deferred matters, there are none. Inquiries, I know there is uh, one inquiry from Councillor Van Meerbergen who flagged it for me before the meeting. I appreciate that. Uh, so I'll turn it to you for your inquiry, Councillor. Thank you uh, very much, Mayor. My inquiry has to do with uh, the Bell 5 dig project. And this is a large, as many of us know, Infra private infrastructure project that's being conducted by Bell, uh, primarily on city-owned property in the form of um, boulevard and such in front of residential homes uh, and, and, uh, and the like. And I've received in the Westmount area literally dozens and dozens of complaints, not because of the in infrastructure project itself, on the, on the five network and the upgrades, which is all great. But there isn't any follow-up in terms of um, 
remedying the properties, remedying the boulevards, et cetera, uh, to restore what they were prior to the construction work. So what we're left with are a series of big holes filled with gravel, exposed wire, exposed cable, and it's not being fixed. In the Westmount area, the work was conducted um, in the winter. And we were told that by May the 15th, per the agreement with the city of London and Bell, by May the 15th, it would be rectified. Uh, that hasn't happened. And so my question to staff is, uh, can we have an update as to where this situation uh, currently sits? Um, and, and what can the city do to expedite the required uh, remediation? And what can the residents of Westmount expect um, their properties and the front of their properties to be rectified? Okay, so that broke up a little bit, but I think we, I see nods that we got the, the gist of everything you're saying, and I, I believe our staff are confident that they can give you an answer. So I'll go That's to our great. staff. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship and Councillor Van Meerbergen for the inquiry. Uh, staff are well aware of the issues caused throughout the city related to the Bell Fiber upgrade, and in fact have actually arranged a meeting with the Vice President in charge of this project from Bell for Monday, involving senior staff from both Mr. Mather's area and mine. We do have some mechanisms at our disposal. We have a one-year clause built into the master agreement for renewal, which we'll be visiting with them, and we could, in uh, um, should that not succeed, consider not providing any new permit until restoration is complete on existing works. So we will be working with Bell's senior management on Monday. Uh, we take this matter quite seriously from both the permit of approved works as well as the utility coordination perspective. It's an inconvenience, but it's also a safety issue in some cases. We're on it, and I will report back as required. Okay, Councillor, go ahead. Um, can staff indicate roughly, I realize it's roughly, when residents can expect some action in terms of actually getting some of getting these properties uh, rectified to the original state. Go ahead. Uh, Your Worship, my understanding is that several the rectifications do date back many weeks. We will be asking for an updated plan indicating when they'll be making full restoration based on the date of original disturbance. I don't have that information from the utility yet, but we will be requiring that from them. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Uh, and uh, just one last follow-up. If, okay. if, if we could be notified, uh, because I don't think I'm the uh, only councillor with this situation. If we could be notified once you have that information, that would be most appreciated. Yeah, I see lots of nods on that. So, uh, so that will that will happen, Councillor. Thanks for the inquiry. <laughs> Um, so I see another counselor putting their hand up. So inquiries are not like where a bunch of counselors jump in. One counselor will ask a specific inquiry of staff. Staff will answer. It's not a debate. So Councillor Trosau, is it on this or is it on something different? I just wanted to say thank you for bringing that up. Okay. Well, Bell, let's talk. We got to do something yeah, about okay. this. It's, counselor, it's like... appreciate the <laughs> witty comment, but uh, it's completely out of order uh, given our procedures. So we're going to, uh, so inquiry has been asked, answered. Appreciate our staff doing that. And um, uh, thank you for raising that for all, all of us, Councillor Van Meer. We're going to, I think it impacts a large part of the city. Uh, our emergent motions, there are none. Bylaws, um, we have a number. Uh, I will say this is how I intend on proceeding with the bylaws. So if councillors would like it done differently, let me know. My intent is to deal with uh, a package of bylaws ranging from 164 to 169, 172 to 183, and the added 184 related to the in-camera piece. So what that will exclude are the two bylaws that Councillor Van Meerbergen uh, asked to be separate related to expropriation. So those would be dealt with separately. So. Unless someone wants something different than that, that's how I'm going to proceed with two sets of votes. One is everything except Councillor Van Meerbergen's uh, desire to vote on something separate, and then the motions that he wanted to vote on separate. Okay, that looks good. So I see everybody nodding. So the first set of bylaws, Councillor Van Meerbergen, will not be not include the ones related to expropriation, but it'll include every other bylaw, all of the uh, uh, adjusted, amended, uh, revised bylaws based on. Um, the changes we made at the committee um, reports uh, from Councillor Lehman 
and the added bylaw that comes out of the in-camera session. So I'll look for a mover for that. Councillor Hopkins and a seconder. Councillor Trosau. No debate on first reading, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. And second reading and a seconder. Councillor Ferreira seconded by Councillor Rahman. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, a mover for third reading. Councillor Ferreira and seconded by Councillor Cuddy. Uh, no debate on third reading, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 13 to zero. Okay, next I'll look for a mover for bylaws 170-171, which were related to expropriations for the East London Link and the Wellington Gateway project. Mover, Councillor Trosau, seconder, Councillor Hopkins. Uh, there is no debate on first reading, so we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 12 to 1. Movers for the reading of those bylaws. Moved by Councillor Ferreira, seconded by Councillor Hillier. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, we'll open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 12 to 1. Third reading of the bills, moved by Councillor McAllister, seconded by Councillor Lehman. Uh, there's no debate on third reading, so we will open that for voting. Closing the vote, motion carries 12 to 1. That brings us to uh, adjournment. I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Trosau, seconded by Councillor McAllister. We do this by hand. All those in favor of adjournment? That motion carries. All right, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Hope to see you at the vigil tonight. <laughs>